Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for making such a wonderful film and now connects Julie to the world so we can know what his life and his connection to China and connection to the contemporary art. Thank you. Um, I would actually like to ask, um, why did you make the film? Well, good evening, Ruby. I'm, I'm very pleased and delighted to join you um, tonight in Hong Kong. I would love to be there, in fact, in person, much more than being uh, only online. Because uh, in the first place, to answer your question, because I like China and I like Hong Kong, and I like contemporary Chinese art, uh, art so much. Um, I started um, investigating uh, the, um, uh, say, connectivity, the connectivity of the social change in China on the one hand and um, the development of design, architecture and art on the other already much earlier. Uh, maybe just briefly about myself, I grew up in the Soviet Union, uh, in, in the GDR, in the communist part of Germany, and I studied in the Soviet Union. Uh, so I was always interested in the transformation uh, former communist countries had undergone uh, since uh, uh, the 1990s. So I was also traveling to China and uh, uh, to Hong Kong already earlier. And uh, when I was the director of the theater in the city of Basel in Switzerland, um, from 1996 to 2006, I befriended also with the architects Herzog and Dömerow. And when they were uh, assigned to design the Olympic Games Stadium in Beijing in the early 2000s, I followed them and decided to make a film, uh, kind of a long-term um, project, a, a feature film about uh, the development of the Olympic Games Stadium in Beijing. And I, I, I made that film, the film's title is Bird's Nest, and I encountered at that time already Uli Sieg for the first time and we befriended because I could see that he is a, a very courageous person uh, with um, many lives because he uh, spent an enormously important time in China. Um, at first as a manager for the first joint venture between Western Corporation and uh, mainland China and later also as a diplomat. And I saw his collection and I felt, wow, this is really extraordinary achievement and uh, speaks uh, to the world about uh, the Chinese uh, social uh, condition of today. Uh, so when I later uh, learned about plans of bringing this collection back to China, I felt maybe this is also a project for another film. And this is the result you saw tonight. Thank you. Uh, Thank maybe you. to say, I have to maybe add one more thing. I was uh, working at the West Kowloon Culture District already at an early stage. Uh, I was an advisor to Ram Kohas, the architect, who was one of the uh, invited architects to develop a master plan proposal for the West Kowloon Culture District between 2009 and 2012. And during this period, I spent a lot of time in Hong Kong advising Kohas uh, and indirectly the authority on certain things uh, I, I uh, developed uh, together with the team about culture and arts at uh, the, uh, the uh, West Kowloon Culture District, uh, among uh, those also M+. So I knew actually the project M+, from the outset, and introduced it also to uh, Uli, and thought it might be actually a great outlet uh, to bring the collection to. Actually, the films um, really capture many uh, uh, the history, contemporary history of China through arts and his uh, Yuri's life and the artist's life, which really, you know, document from the 60s, and the 70s and the 80s and 90s and 2000s. And now to Hong Kong, which is we enter a different phase since 2016, since he donated his collection to Hong Kong. Hong Kong has many much changed in the last couple of what, last six years. So then you, the film actually speak to a, even a longer journey. And um, so um, I would like to know what, what you think about, you know, um, his collection being housed in Hong Kong. Yeah, as I suggested earlier, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't want to say that I'm an expert uh, because I'm not a Chinese person. Uh, I'm not even an art historian uh, as such. I, I did many other things, but I, of course, learned a lot about contemporary Chinese art, and I know in the meantime many artists. 
However, I would not call myself an expert. But from my personal perspective, uh, as I said, um, I, I know Hong Kong since uh, the 90s and uh, in particular also since the um, instigation of the project, the West Kowloon Culture District. And I always felt this was a very ambitious project. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on such large scale projects in other countries. I worked before Hong Kong and Dubai uh, and developed there the Culture and Arts Authority. And currently I'm again back in the Middle East. And I have to say, um, I felt that um, this is a project for generations. And um, the museum and plus is a project for uh, the 21st century. It is an, a possibility to show the shift of um, um, the cultural relevance in Asia um, in a particular significant way. And that's why uh, I was very excited about the project itself, speaking about the museum and um, the possibility of uh, creating an almost universal outlet for culture and arts, including even design, architecture, and fashion. And in the core, hosting a significant collection about the status of uh, contemporary art in China today. So that Hong Kong being in general a hub for the whole Asia uh, hosts also a museum which reflects uh, the uh, uh, development, the history, but also the current status and maybe also the future of contemporary Chinese art. And I think this is what is happening now. And I sort of anticipated this with the film. For me, uh, the moment Ulysses made the deal uh, between M Plus and uh, his collection um, in 2012, I felt that his mission is sort of accomplished. Of course, the museum was not there yet, but the plan of bringing back the promise he had made to the artists in China, that one day he would bring back this collection to a public museum, uh, in, in China uh, was, it was uh, in sight. And that, that was for me the main reason to make the film because I saw now we have chapters um, like his beginnings uh, after uh, Mao's death uh, when he uh, introduced the market economy to China in some way and later um, as a diplomat and uh, a starting collector and finally uh, with the collection moving back to China, to, to Hong Kong. Of course, I know there are many specificities about the relationship between Hong Kong and China. There were always uh, specificities, uh, specificities and there will be also in the future. But I hope, and uh, I saw this for the first time when there was a brief um, uh, a moment where a major core of the collection was already on display in Hong Kong uh, during Art Basel Hong Kong a few years ago. I saw how many people also from mainland China came to Hong Kong to see that show and that um, explained to me the importance of um, bringing the collection back to China, bringing the, back, uh, the collection back to a place where uh, it can be showcased in a professional manner. And I think M Plus is for this the best place. I have a chance to visit uh, M Plus um, a couple months ago. Um, it was it's such a beautiful space and it's the really, um, the right choice to exhibit um, China's contemporary art. And I think Hong Kong is also a very, still an open place. And um, it's the chance for um, the world to see the best contemporary Chinese contemporary art in Asia. Um, I would like to open to um, Q&A. And if anyone who have questions, please raise your hand and um, can someone pass the mic? Well, okay, I'll ask the question. You, the, you have visited so many uh, Chinese artists and you have, I, I noticed there's so much archival footage and it's, and then of course you have to get permission to film in China, in Beijing. So that must take you, took you a long time to do the film, right? Yes, as I mentioned, I had already some experience with an earlier film I made since 2003 about the bird's nest, the, the, the Beijing Olympic Games Stadium. Therefore, I, I knew a little bit what does it mean in reality to 
make a documentary uh, on uh, Chinese uh, mainland Chinese territory. Uh, we worked also with um, similar people, um, and altogether it worked actually pretty smooth, I must say. Um, I worked in various countries uh, worldwide, and um, I had actually never really serious uh, problems to face with filming in public space and neither in institutions or elsewhere in, in China. Uh, in particular, also, you know, it, we, as you saw from, from the film, we were not only encountering artists, but also people from uh, the Schindler Company, for example, or uh, we were able uh, to visit the, for, the former steel factory, uh, the largest maybe steel factory in the world, which is almost in the city in itself, but in the meantime shut down. We were still able to visit this and to take pictures there. Because for me, it was very open, uh, important to uh, in kind of reenact the reality of a China which is in the meantime gone thanks to an extraordinary reconstruction of the whole country. I know this from East Germany too, that after the, uh, the, the war fell in East Germany and Germany uh, reunited uh, in East Germany, everything was changed, you know, buildings uh, were rebuilt and infrastructure was built, etc. cetera, it became in a very short period of time, a very modern country. And the same happened maybe even in a faster way. And of course, in a different scale in China. And in some way, I wanted to show this in the film too. But for me, it was important uh, to start from scratch. And therefore, even when we shot in the 2015, 14, 15, uh, I was keen to find, to identify, to discover spaces which still look like in the 1980s when Ulysses worked there. Uh, and I was very uh, keen and, and, and happy finally also to discover such places with the help of uh, Chinese people who were very forthcoming uh, on this. Uh, another thing which was important, you may have noticed the music. I was actually uh, pretty happy that Feng Mambo, who is a famous uh, Chinese artist, was one of the first who ever used video and even video games in his art uh, already since the 90s. Uh, he owns an archive of the music uh, of the time of the beginning of the change in China and therefore the time when Ulysses arrived in China, speaking about the late 70s, early 80s. Most of this music is not available nowhere, even in archives today anymore. So he did actually a very important job also in collecting this type of music, which is an interesting merger between the former communist Chinese music and the first influences coming mostly from Hong Kong or from Taiwan. Uh, you, you just heard it, for example, a kind of Hawaii guitar, uh, which was, of course, something totally uh, foreign to Chinese ears, mainland Chinese ears before 1980. So in some way, I, I try to reenact, uh, to recreate the environment, the visual and audio environment Uli Sik was immersed in when he, when he came to, to China in the 1980s. And at the same time, um, yes, I met many artists, but I did something a curator would probably not focus so much on. I did actually ask them more about their life and not so much about their artwork. Not that I wasn't interested in the artwork, but I was particularly interested to understand how they became artists and how they live in the former uh, communist uh, times before 1980. They, most of them are actually my generation. I was born in 1960 and most of the artists uh, in the picture were born around 1962, a few years earlier, a few years later. So we share this and we even came from the same kind of utopian communist world uh, which is not uh, the same or not there anymore today. That's why it is for me a particular interesting point. And as I mentioned, I studied in the Soviet Union. Some of them even spoke a little bit of Russian because they had learned it at school, which was also an interesting connection uh, to establish. Uh, so I could in some um, way a, a bit, uh, imagine the social condition they grew up in or with uh, in the China before 1980 and even after. And that's why uh, I felt uh, this was a great complementary to the story of Ulysses himself because he lived there at the same time, but of course in a totally different world as a foreigner coming from Switzerland. So to, to combining these two perspectives uh, of the people, in this case, mostly artists from China and uh, on Ulysses on the other hand, that was very forthcoming. And the artwork uh, for me was, um, that was probably the most important uh, point uh, and, and impulse uh, for me to, to decide to make that film 
the artwork is extremely storytelling. So it really says a lot, um, the paintings, the sculptures, the installations say a lot about what it meant to live through the social change in mainland China. So I felt that they are almost like witnesses of history, the, the artworks themselves, they speak to you. And that's why I portrayed them also and gave them a lot of space in the film. The music really uh, bring back the era that I love the music in there because it's so, it's so um, you know, now you told me that it's from a private collection because they, you know, hardly heard that kind of music. And it's also in, in that live that was the music, the, the, those era. And so when you have the music and the image put together, it really brought back all the nostalgic era and, and how they lived at that time. Mm, sure. It was wonderful. Mm. And the art, well, of course, I would love to see more of the artwork. You should make a film like after showing all the artists and artwork because it will, people will want to see more uh, when Empress opened uh, mm. for the, mm. to show the um, contemporary arts production. Sure. Yeah. Sure. There's one thing um, I always found a particular uh, about the collection and uh, its uh, uh, whereabouts because people were speaking about something nobody had seen yet. You know, that was the interesting thing. Uh, there were lots of discussions about this collection over the last years, but nobody had really seen everything yet except the collector and a very few other pri privileged people. And maybe I saw a, a major share, but even I did not see everything, of course. So it, it was a, a kind of black box where many people uh, were speculating about. And that's why it is now a great moment in November when this black box is going to be revealed and people will be able to see the reality of the collection, the diversity of, of expressions, uh, of subjects, of themes, actually also of uh, generations of artists being involved. Even in the film, as you saw, yes, the majority were my generation, but they are of course also a spree of much younger uh, artists now in, included in the collection. And also a few artists, um, one of them being also in the film, um, who still experience the Mao times and have of course a way larger range of uh, political and uh, also art experience. So that's why I'm, I'm very curious, of course, to experience, to see what is going to happen after uh, November 11, November 12, when the Hong Kongers and at some point, hopefully also the world will be able to discover the full collection in this beautiful museum. I think the collection will be revealed part bits by bits. It's like a peeling an onion. So I don't think you see the black box only a page at a time, right? Yes, yes, you're very right. Absolutely. Yes. Any questions from the audience? Well, don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Just one, 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 one remark about, about the music. There was one single screening we had also in mainland China of the film. The film was shown actually in many countries and not for the first time in Hong Kong, but I'm very happy that there's a new screening uh, which happened today. Uh, but I think three years ago or so, we had also a screening uh, in Chengdu. Uh, and this was uh, really also well attended by many mainland Chinese people. And they started singing and humming at some point uh, when they were listening to the music. That was particular uh, uh, kind of charming and uh, moving for me. Yes, yeah, that's so true. Maybe you can release a, a, a CD of the music if the artists allow you. <laughs> no, no, we have. There is a DVD. Uh, it's available. Yes, the film is available on DVD, uh, certainly. And I hope that uh, it will be also available in the museum shop of M+. Great. Would the music be available as well? Well, not, not separately. Not separately, just as the, as the audio track. But it's actually a good idea. Maybe I should talk to the artist from Mambo to release it in some way. Yes, it will be. It, people are going to love it because it's mm -hmm. such a nostalgic era. Yes, I guess so. Okay. Well, if, if we don't have any questions from the audience, maybe we'll uh, thank you so much for joining thank us. You, thank you.
Thank you very much for, for making this possible. And if there is, if, if I'm still uh, on air, uh, there is a website. I have a website. People can also reach me or personally on this website if there is uh, any kind of other question. I'm happy to respond. I hope to come back to Hong Kong soon at some point when the quarantine rules are a bit easier. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, thank you. I want to thank so much Michael and Ruby um, and the Consul General of um, Switzerland and Hong Kong. I hope you all enjoy the film. Um, I certainly en enjoyed it again, watching it again. I hope you, um, in about a month, like Michael said, we will have the opportunity of seeing M Plus for ourselves as it opens uh, its door to the public. And we're in Hong Kong. We'll be able to be the one among the first to see it. So um, can't wait. Uh, at this time, I wanted to let you know about an exciting a collaboration and giveaway. Uh, as you know, we have a, a current exhibition about La Lang. It's closing uh, on October 24th. And we're really excited to announce that Asia Society Hong Kong, in collaboration with Shanghai Tang, has a limited edition La Lang scarf. The scarf crafted with pure soft mulberry silk feature an artwork, Two Friends by La Lang, which is currently on display at our uh, exhibition, Extend the Figure. Uh, the, star the scarf will be in our Asia Society store starting in November and is available for pre-order now at our online store or physical store. And to celebrate the launch, we are doing an Instagram giveaway where one lucky winner can walk away with a long scarf and check it out uh, at our Instagram for further detail. The by the way, um, I think those of you who signed up to see the documentary A La Lang last week, uh, unfortunately, due to the weather, it had to be postponed. It will be re, uh, we will be showing the documentary this Friday, October 15th at 4.30 p.m. So sign up and we hope to see you then. Unfortunately, I will still be in quarantine, but I know you will enjoy the film. And I want to, again, thank you all uh, and, for, and have a wonderful evening and look forward to seeing you in person soon. Thank you and good night.